Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Nature Conservancy of Canada again for another one of our conservation conversation webinars. Today's uh, topic is Conserving Pronghorn, a collaborative effort to help conserve the fastest land mammal in North America. And our presenter today is Lita Pazderic, who is NCC's own natural area manager in the prairie grasslands of Alberta. So to get things started right away, I'm just going to pass the screen off to Lita. So Lita, whenever you're ready, over to you. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Keisha. Uh, and yeah, just a just a fair warning. Um, I'm I live pretty rural, so my internet connection is um, authentic rural experience. So um, just bear with us if there's a little bit of glitchiness. Uh, hopefully the lag won't be too too bad so uh uh yeah keisha mentioned that you guys like to hear a little bit about uh who the natural area manager is and and kind of a background on us so i am i thought i would just share a little i'm originally from claire's home and i moved to lethbridge with um the intention like to to go to college uh, i went to the lethbridge community college and I studied renewable resource management there and went on to get um, focused on fish and wildlife technology. And then uh, they have a pretty cool transfer program over there. So I hopped on over to the University of Lethbridge to obtain my environmental science degree. Um, and I guess while I was working or while I was going to school in the summers, I worked for Waterton Lakes National Park doing invasive species monitoring. Um, and then I've done Quite a few little jobs here and there. I worked for Cows and Fish for a while and Alberta Environment. Um, I spent quite a few years with the Old Man Watershed Council uh, as their program coordinator uh, before jumping on over to uh, the Nature Conservancy in 2015. And uh, primarily why I was one, I was looking for something a little bit more hands-on. I wanted to work with landowners and really do on the ground action. And um, you know, it couldn't have been more perfect of a fit coming to NCC as a natural area manager. I get to do just that. I work with landowners every day um, and other passionate folks like yourselves, and we get stuff done. You know, it feels really good. So um, my area that I manage for NCC is the kind of east of Waterton Lakes National Park and moving into Milk River Ridge and then into the Milk River Basin. So I cover a large chunk of the south and um, when I first started with NCC I was actually over all the way kind of towards the Saskatchewan border so I manage Cypress Hills area and um, Bukowski Lake so I'm pretty familiar with our prairie grasslands and um, I'm just thrilled to have the opportunity today to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in the south um, specifically uh, to do with the pronghorn. So I will, I'll just get right into it. Let's see if I can move this forward. Uh, it's not gonna let me move it forward, hold on. There we go. So pronghorn, they are a unique prairie species. Uh, they're found in Alberta and Saskatchewan and primarily the Western United States. And sometimes you'll get the odd one in Manitoba that's kind of drifted up from North Dakota. But for the most part, they're a little bit more Western prairie. And um, in Alberta, they're considered sensitive. And this is just due to how um, they're so susceptible to inclement weather. So uh, an example of this is back in, I believe it was 2010. In Alberta, we lost over 50% of the population of our pronghorn due to severe um, weather, like severe snowstorms. And so it's pretty scary how quickly a population can be decimated. And that's why we have to do what we can to protect this really cool species. And um, the really neat thing about this species is that they are a species unto themselves. So they're not genetically related to anything else. Um, and the closest genetically related um, animal is, drum roll, we'll wait for it to come up, it's taking a while, the giraffe, I know, that is um, 
super bizarre and I love it so much, but uh, that's a fun fact for you guys to carry with you if you ever want to impress people with some, some knowledge. Uh, another neat thing about the pronghorn is that they are the fastest land mammal in North America and only and second fastest uh, land mammal in the world, only second to the cheetah. And it's pretty close, actually. I believe the cheetah has clocked out at just over 100 kilometers an hour, I think 102, something like that. And uh, the pronghorn are uh, close by with, I think, 99 kilometers per hour. And they can go the fastest uh, speed for the longest distance, too. So that's pretty, pretty unique. Um, and then they also have the, la the longest land migration in North America. And so they'll migrate, it'll, it's ones that will rival like the Serengeti, you know, the, one, the migrations along the Serengeti. So it's pretty cool. Not a lot of people realize that pronghorn migrate. Um, and this map that I'm showing here, it's uh, just so that you guys kind of have a reference. I don't know, up at the top here is Hannah. And then over to the left is Lethbridge. And then down at the bottom, we've got Malta and Glasgow in the United States and Regina over on the right. So it gives you an idea of the region we're looking at. And the green arrows show their migration routes. So these, they undergo um, daily, both daily and seasonal migration. And they tend to be the same every every year. Not always do the same animals migrate. Some are a little bit more stationary, but the routes that they take are pretty consistent. And um, they're really driven by weather and the need for food. So they're always moving and seeking out food and following the different conditions. And um, you can see by this map, the red lines are uh, major highways and roads, and then you can imagine all the other, you know, smaller roadways and fence lines. And so there's a lot of barriers that pronghorn uh, come up against during their migration. And um, I'll just speak to highways first in that you can imagine, just picture trying to cross the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, and you've got a fence on one side, well, on either side, and you have to get enough speed and you're trying to maneuver between uh, moving vehicles, it's, it's gonna take a ton of energy and it's super stressful for these species. So they, um, and they're, they're very nervous creatures just by nature. So it works up all their, it takes them a lot of energy just to get the, to get the courage to, to cross the highway. Um, another major barrier is fence lines. And so pronghorn, the unique thing about another fun fact and unique thing about pronghorn is that they never really evolve to jump over fences. I'm told they can do it, but they tend not to. And especially in high stress situations, they, they'll want to go under. And um, where this is a problem is if the fence line the bottom wire is too low or maybe it's um, cage wire and they can't get through at all uh, or during snow events if that snow builds up it they just can't uh, pass through and so this becomes a huge problem we've been told like the alberta conservation association um, and the alberta fishing game association they've done different studies with um, andrew jakes dr andrew jakes He's a researcher down in the United States focusing on pronghorn. And his findings is that they will come up against anywhere from 100 to 1,000 fence lines during their migration. Like that's incredible. And if each one is very difficult to get through, you can just imagine the stress uh, for that animal. And um, so I'm going to show you a little video here. I hope my internet is, is enough to to play it i just i want you guys to really focus on the behavior of the animal so they're super nervous they're trying to get under it um and this last one here 
I want you to watch as it goes under the fur that flies off um, from the back. So that's a major problem. And um, this next slide will show you if you can see on its back there, that's an open, that's a wound, I guess that's a recovered wound from going under really low wires. And when they rip the hair off, it takes some of the skin sometimes. And this can be a major problem. It can leave, leave it open to infection or um, frostbite, even hypothermia. So um, this is, it's a major problem. And the video and, and photo is provided by Alberta Conservation Association, uh, part of that study. They set up trail cams along fence lines and along known uh, routes for the pronghorn. And so they were able to capture a lot of imagery um, of these, these critters going under the fence lines. Um, so that's really, you know, pretty awful. But there is some good news is there are different organizations, NCC included, doing good things to try and mitigate these issues. So uh, one example is when, when NCC is looking at securing properties, we want to make sure we're prioritizing um, where we are focusing our efforts. So we will use, like this is a map showing um, this kind of southeast corner of the province and the the purple shaded layer shows uh, spring pronghorn habitat. So if if we're trying to help uh, pronghorn in and aid them in their migration routes or uh, critical, like the yellow shows critical sage growth habitat, we use this information to help guide our decision making. So whether or not we're going to purchase the property and, and protect it uh, outright and, and have it as deeded land, um, or if we're going to place a conservation easement on it, um, so it would it would remain as privately owned land, but there would be certain restrictions that that landowner would have to abide by. So, for example, he wouldn't be able to cultivate native prairie um, if that's the restriction says so. So we will use this this data and these layers to help um, guide our way. And this next map that's going to come up here shows an easement, so it's private property that we placed a conservation easement on. Um, it's a pretty recent one. The area outlined in white is the property boundary, and then that gray shaded area is actually, um, the again, the, pr the pronghorn habitat. So this easement is, is needing, you know, checking all those boxes. It's, we're protecting uh, pronghorn migration area. Part of the restriction is in, in the easement is going to make sure that all fences um, that are newly installed are going to be wildlife friendly. Um, if there's any cage wire, it will be removed. And so this is just a good example of how we can help efforts uh, beyond just our own properties. Um, but when we do purchase our own property, we one of the first things we will do is to, to take a look at the fences and make sure that they are wildlife friendly. So that means we want to raise the, the bottom wire um, up to at least 18 inches to allow for the pronghorn to get under. And we'll replace the barbed wire with a smooth wire. And so then it's, it's easy for not only pronghorn, but you know, other, other species, um, young deer, that sort of thing can go under the fence. And then we want to lower the top wire to about 40 inches from the ground. And that's to help other species jump over the fence. And um, so we want to take, this is a picture, <laughs> the fence in the top left there is actually an, a fence that bordered the uh, one of the NCC properties out near Saskatchewan, or out near Cypress Hills there. And it was a terrible fence, nothing could get through that. And we want to replace it with a fence like on the right hand side here that's three strands and wildlife can get over and under it fairly easily. Um, another great program that is going on right now is the Alberta Conservation Association and the Alberta Fish and Game Association have been working with private landowners for over a decade to retrofit their existing fences and make them a little bit more wildlife friendly. 
and this is at no cost to the landowner. So it's a real uh, win for, for the landowners. They don't have to put too much in um, and, and they can get a fence that's a bit more friendly for wildlife passing through. I believe they've done over 350 kilometers of fence line um, in southern Alberta. So it's pretty fantastic and that's all volunteer effort. Um, and then this last program that I'll just touch on is called Pronghorn Crossing and it's a citizen science uh, project. And typically I, my coworker, Megan Jensen, um, she usually talks about this part because um, she's actually the program coordinator with Moustakas Institute on her, you know, spare time. And so she runs this pronghorn crossing program and she's on maternity leave at the time, at, you know, right now. So she, she couldn't be here to present, but um, anyways, it's a really cool program. So they've been running it for about, I believe, three, three years. And what you do is you download an app to your phone and it's super, super simple to use. If you see pronghorn or other wildlife along the road, even if it's uh, dead on the road, you just go in, you submit an observation, and then it'll ask you like how many species or how many pronghorn did you see? Uh, were they alive? Were they dead? And then you hit submit. And if you can't do it while you're driving or like if, if you don't, you know, you shouldn't be doing it while you're driving, get your, get your passenger to do it. Um, but also if you just don't have a phone to to download the app onto, then I suggest you can do it um, on your computer once you get home, or you can call in too and just let Megan know where you saw um, the animal and she can mark it on a map. And then um, the whole idea behind it is we really want to get an idea of where these pinch points on the migration routes are that these animals are having a hard time crossing. And with that information, hopefully we can, uh, you know, mitigate the problem and, and come up with some cool solutions. So this image is of an overpass in Wyoming. And um, I'm just going to show you a video of it actually being used. So this is the kind of thing that we would want to try to install, say, near Medicine Hat over the Trans-Canada Highway. Wouldn't that be amazing to have an overpass where these, these animals could use and not be super stressed out? And um, from what I've heard, they've had huge successes with overpasses. They don't like underpasses. They don't want to go underneath. They tend to need to go up and over. So um, yeah, I just love watching this video and, and seeing the pronghorn you know, come over it and use it uh, successfully. So that's the whole idea of the pronghorn crossing project. And um, I, I think it's still, the program's still gonna be running uh, for another year, I believe. And then they're not quite sure if they're gonna continue it on or if they have enough data to move on to the next phase. But um, if you really wanna know more information about that, you can shoot uh, Megan an email uh, afterwards and she'll she'll respond to you quick. Um, or send me an email and I'll get it. I'll make sure Megan gets it. And so I've just left my contact information as well as Megan's contact information here for you and um, yeah I guess we can move into the question period um, of the presentation. Um, okay. Keisha can come back that would be great or Hannah there you are. <laughs> Hi everyone thanks Lita thanks so much that was really really great and really informative um, such cool animals. Uh, if you have any questions, just a reminder, on the top right-hand corner of your screen, there should be an icon with a little chat box. Feel free to pop your question in there, and I'll read them off, and we'll get Lita to answer them while she's on the line. But I'll give you all a moment. But in the meantime, that was really great, Lita. Thanks so much. It's really interesting to learn about these iconic species, and it's amazing to me always how a few people know that they exist in Alberta and in North America. Um, so really appreciate about NCC's efforts. Um, I did have a, 
question, my personal question. Um, it seems like there's a lot of really good data about the migration of pronghorn. I was just wondering how that was collected and how we know that they follow such distinct migration patterns and what that process looks like. Right, yeah, no, that's a really, that's a really good question because um, pronghorn are, like I was saying before, they're super skittish and nervous. And so it's quite difficult to get um, close to them. And so trying to research them and follow them would be, you know, quite a challenge. But uh, like I mentioned before, the research put on by Dr. Andrew Jakes um, from Montana, he, he actually radio uh, collared a lot of the animals. And, and I mean, he's working with the Alberta Conservation Association and they are tracking these, these animals and have been for many years. And so they've been able to get a lot of really good information that way. And then I believe um, they do some aerial monitoring as well, uh, just so not to scare them, they stay up pretty high and then they can kind of track the movements that way and get an idea of how many animals are moving on what migration paths. So you, it's incredible if you ever have a chance to take in a presentation by um, Andrew Jakes. It's such a great, um, great presentation and full of lots of really good information on pronghorn. So yeah, good question. Perfect. I'll definitely be looking him up afterwards. Uh, and then we have a question here from mm. Bob and Diane. Um, how many pronghorn are estimated in Alberta? What's their estimated population? Ooh, that is a good question. And I do not know. Um, I will have to, I'll write it down and I will check in with Andrew and see if we can come up with a number for you and get back to you. But that's a good one. I'd like to know too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Doesn't look like we have any more questions here. So I'm gonna throw it off to Keisha um, to wrap things up. But if you do come up with any questions, Lita provided her contact information and Keisha also emailed out the details of the webinar. So feel free to respond to either with any questions that you have about pronghorn or NCC's work in pronghorn habitat and helping to protect the species. Throw it to Keisha now. Oh. Perfect, sorry, I was having some difficulty with my camera there. I think I was just a little too click happy. Um, so Lita, mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you so much to you for you know taking the time to give this fantastic presentation about a very iconic species that I feel like doesn't get as much attention as it should. Um, personally, that's right. my favorite <laughs> Thank you so much, Lita, and thank you so much to everyone who took the time to come sit and listen to this presentation today. And again, like Hannah said, if you do have any follow-up questions, um, you know, please feel free to email them to me directly. I'll be following up with a recording um, in a few days. Just I need a bit of time to transcribe this so that it is um, friendly for those who are hearing it. And then we will be sharing it. Um, but in the meantime, if you are looking for some other webinars to attend, we have our next one coming up on August 31st. The topic is Conserving the Cronus Pass. Um, and so we'll kind of be talking about a bunch of different initiatives that NCC is working on in the Crow's Nest Pass with our natural area manager down there, Emily. Um, so I think that ends today's meeting, unless there's any more burning questions at the last minute which I don't think there are. So thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you so much, Lita. And I hope that everyone thank has you a great day. Bye. Yeah, thank you. See you.